A. So um, I want to start the talk and ask you three questions. Uh, so you can just keep track of the answers. So three questions to make you think. So here's the first question. If a stranger tried to take your clothes off, would you try and stop him or her? Yes, no, or uncertain. So I, I already see um, a lot of heads nodding. So the answer is uh, yes, probably, of course, we would do that. So here's the second question. Have you ever screamed or yelled or moaned out loud when you are upset or in pain or in some kind of physical or emotional distress? And again, the answer is probably for most of us, yes. Um, that when, when we feel this way, we, we, we do vocalize. And then the third question is, if you are confined in a room or a space against your will, would you try and find ways to escape? So yes, no, not sure. The answer for most of us is yes. Eventually, we would try and find a way to escape. So what do you think about those questions? So if you answered yes to one or more, and most of you probably answered yes to all of them, and if you are a person living with dementia, especially if you are living in residential care. Now, um, I'll just uh, say as a sidestep here that um, to me, the F word of dementia is facility. So I never use the word facility. I always say residential care. So when I say residential care, if you're more used to using the word facility, you can substitute that. But if you answered yes to one of these questions and you were in residential care, you would be labeled as resisting care if uh, related to the first question of taking clothes off or being agitated uh, if you were in pain or distress or wandering if you were trying to uh, escape from a confined space. And you know, in, in the medical world, in the, um, uh, the non-patient care centered world that most of us live in, we call these the so-called neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. We medicalize the notion of these things. But is that really the best way to think about these common things? Um, there's an organization you may have heard of called the Dementia Action Alliance. And they use the term for these challenging behaviors, they use the term behavioral expressions. And I like that term because, you know, essentially from the three questions I asked you, you know, if you think about the person with dementia who has a CNA, a certified nursing assistant that comes in to give them a bath, and they've never met that person before, they've got a stranger who wants to then take their clothes off and spray water on them or put them in a stream of water. And, you know, to resist that is really just a normal behavioral expression. So this is kind of the first teaching point of the seminar today is to think about what, you know, the medical world labels as the neuropsychiatric symptoms yeah. as, you know, how is this what the, the person living with dementia is expressing, how is this just a normal behavioral expression, you know, given where they're at? And that's the part we're gonna talk about next is given where they're at. So what are the common behavioral expression, challenging behavioral expressions? I'm gonna focus on early to middle stage dementia. So first and foremost is apathy. The person just lacks motivation. They lack the desire to get up and go to do things. Um, often the person will have a lack of insight. At the extreme, they may be in actual denial that they even have anything wrong with them. They may experience impaired judgment. Um, so maybe the person has made some bad financial decisions or other decisions affecting uh, maybe their personal safety. So these are our common things. 
And then with dementia, there are changes in emotionality. So I say with, with the, for the person living in dementia, um, how they're able to express emotion does pro get progressively more challenged through uh, the course of the journey. Uh, so on one hand, they, be, they may become more withdrawn and isolated into themselves. And I'll talk more about that later. Or they may have some behavioral disinhibition and they may be overly expressive of their emotions, which may manifest like as agitation or even aggression. So apathy, lack of insight, impaired judgment, uh, uh, changes in emotional expression, these are all the frontal lobe changes that happen in people who are living with dementia, especially like Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia. Um, the person may have changes in mood. So we know that comorbid depression or anxiety occurs in somewhere between about 50 to 70% of people living with dementia. Depression often looks like irritability or moodiness, maybe more than necessarily sad mood. You may see obsessive compulsive behaviors. Um, you know, the person may both have obsessive thoughts and they may have compulsive behaviors or the combination. And then one of those sort of the outplays of that is they may hoard. They may hoard money, they may hoard other personal possessions, and they may even develop some paranoia uh, about the things that they're hoarding. That's my money, you know, you can't have it. Um, probably the most common challenging behavior that we see in our, our memory counseling program from care partners is repetitive questions. You know, the person has short-term memory loss, that's the kind of the first and worst symptom of Alzheimer's disease. And they just ask questions over and over because they forget that they just ask them. Or if the person has some sort of discomfort, they may have repetitive vocalizations. I'll talk more about that later as well. And they may have some behaviors that go along uh, with the vocalizations or just some repetitive behaviors like reaching out, trying to grab people that walk by them. Um, and then kind of the last group, and these are not in any particular order, um, the person may have lost identity. You know, they may, so by lost identity, I mean, they may not know their loved one, their spouse or their adult child, you know, or who, whoever the important people are in their life, they may not recognize them anymore. And I'll tell a story about how that happened with, with my wife and I uh, towards the end of her journey. The person may have delusions. So a delusion is when you believe something that's true that's not true. Um, so they may have delusions about money um, or delusions about fidelity, uh, delusions about being harmed. These are very common in in across all types of, of the common dementias. Um, and then lastly, there may be some disinhibited behavior. These are kind of the front row and center symptoms of frontotemporal dementia or so-called behavior, behavior variant frontotemporal dementia where the person has just lost their breaks. So they might be rude, they might be socially inappropriate with their comments or their behaviors. Uh, they may have crying or laugh, la laughing episodes, and they often will crave sweets or carbohydrates, and they'll binge on carbohydrates. So these are the more common challenging behaviors in early to middle stage dementia. We'll talk about some that occur in later stage dementia a bit later on. And so um, I want to share with you a story um, related to just uh, my journey with my wife. So this is a picture of us uh, a little over 10 years ago. Um, and you would never know by looking at Rebecca from this picture that she was already towards the end of the middle stage of her dementia. So she, we still knew each other. She knew who I was as her husband. At this point, we had been married, I think, 31 years. We had been together 35 years since our sophomore year of college. But you would never know by looking at her that I had to help her get dressed in the morning. I had to cut her food to help her eat. 
Um, she needed help uh, taking a shower, you know, getting uh, undressed in the evening and into her night clothes, sort of uh, help with her, her tooth brushing and her nighttime routine. I mean, she was very dependent. You just would never know by by looking at her. It's it's one of the things that I say is it's an ambiguous loss component of being a dementia care partner because until the very end when they get the look, you know, the look of somebody with advanced dementia, they really look fine. And um, and often with Alzheimer's, language is preserved until well into the middle stage. So they might be able to have a casual conversation. And somebody will say to you, you know, when you're doing all those things, the person is quite dependent on you. They'll say, oh, well, Rebecca looks great. She must be doing fine. And, you know, and that is a real that's an ambiguous part of of the loss of being a, a dementia care partner. So what happened on this day in August of 2013, it was almost exactly three years before she died. I was giving, serving her coffee in the morning on our back, our back sun porch. And it was a sunny day in North Carolina that day. And Rebecca didn't have any gray hair. She's um, 57 years old in this picture, didn't have a gray hair on her head. And the sun was shining in and I looked at her and I said, Sweetie, your hair looks beautiful this morning. And she looked at me with this blank expression and she said, I have no idea who you are. And from that morning forward until the end, until she died of that disease three years later, she didn't recognize me as her husband. We have three adult daughters who at the time were in their mid to late 20s and she didn't recognize our daughters as her children. She didn't remember that we got married. She didn't remember that she went to graduate school and had a master's degree in speech pathology. As best we could tell, kind of her life was erased back to about middle school. She grew up in the Midwest and that's about kind of what she lost. And the night before she knew the kids and me. I still, you know, with all, all of my expertise studying the human brain for 40 years, I still don't understand what happened that day. Now, uh, you, you empathetically have thought about that experience from my perspective, but now let's shift to her perspective because what happened on that terrible day? Well, her caregiving changed immensely after that day. She became agitated. She did resist care. She even became aggressive. She became paranoid. She started hoarding money in her jewelry. She would uh, walk around our home and say, I want to go home. I want to go home. So she would start trying to wander from the house. She got out one day and walked a mile from home before I realized that she was gone. Thankfully, a friend of hers saw her walking down the street and, and picked her up. She started resisting my care with getting dressed and getting ready for bed and especially showering. She had episodes of depression and she began sundowning. And so what happened? Well, what happened is that her attachments, the people in her life that were familiar to her, her home that she had known as her home for more than 20 years, the people in her, her surroundings were no longer for familiar to her. And that's my transition for you to now the attachment part of, of this discussion. And really the, the whole central theme of what I'm gonna share the rest of this morning is that people living with dementia um, suffer attachment loss. And that often it's the attachment loss that is the underlying uh, factor in driving many of, not all, but many or even most of their behaviors. So let's shift a little bit and let's talk about attachment. Now, many of you uh, uh, are attachment-focused therapists. Uh, you've studied attachment in your training. What you're gonna get from me today is very much attachment light. I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth, but I'll just uh, refocus kind of thinking about attachment uh, so that we're thinking about it from the perspective of a person living with dementia, you as someone who's partnering with a, a caregiver, 
Uh, or if, uh, if you are a caregiver, you'll think about attachment from that caregiving perspective. So what is attachment in relationships? So very simply stated, you know, going back to the 1950s, uh, Bowlby's theory of attachment, it's how we come to like or love another person, how we experience the joy of being together, what I'm going to call for today's talk, the attachment bonds that we have with our peeps, and to avoid the dislike of being apart from people we like or love. And I'll call that phenomenon separation distress. So attachment theory says that from the moment we're born, we seek out attachment initially with our mother, but then, you know, more broadly with our parental and family figures. But from our mother, we sort of biologically are driven to seek from her nourishment, comfort, safety, security, and emotional responsiveness. And you get sort of that sense from the picture that I have here is that, you know, from the moment that child is, is born, maybe even from uh, prenatally, that these attachment bonds are forming and they're very important. So that if we talk about a child, for instance, who's securely attached, they're able to interact with strangers and not feel threatened. They're able to separate from their parents without feeling anxious. They can explore new situations without being fearful. They have a certain confidence about them and a positive self-esteem, and they're socially connected. So if we go back to early childhood, they begin to form attachment bonds with their parents, and then their broader family of origin, their siblings, and then extended family. And then as they grow up and they start getting friends in school, uh, uh, elementary, middle, and high school, you know, they form attachment bonds with friends. Then sort of in high school, the, the parents become maybe a little bit less important. The friendships become more important. Then they, in young adulthood, they find a partner. Uh, they have co-workers. And then, you know, our attachments just mushroom through life. Some people come and go. We have some core attachments that we maintain throughout our lifespan. Uh, and then we have other attachments that uh, come in or out of our life, depending on uh, our family, our, our work situation, our social situation. But that's the notion of the social connectedness of secure attachment. Whereas insecure attachment, so, you know, there are some different types of insecure attachment. I'll, I'll allude to those later. But if we just look at insecure attachment more globally from the perspective of a child, these children feel more threatened by strangers. They may isolate themselves or they may become more anxious uh, when they're separated from their parents, depending on their insecure attachment style. They'll be more fearful or anxious in new situations, and they won't have that confidence and that sort of good self-esteem that a more securely attached child would have. And you see that in their, their social relationships. They have weaker attachment bonds, you know, both within their family and then beyond their family with friends and either others as they age up into adulthood. So what happens then when a parent and a child become separated? You know, what's the, the biology of separation distress? So um, when, when my uh, kids were young, uh, we used to go into uh, department stores and they would separate from, from my wife and I and they would run into the clothing racks. You know, this is back when department stores were more of a thing. You know, now they just, uh, they get lost in the Amazon space rather than in racks of clothing. You know, but they would hide, and of course, it would freak my wife and I out because if we if we didn't see them for a while, you know, we we would wonder where they were. So imagine a child who wanders off and gets separated from their parent, a young child like this one I have pictured here. So what will happen is that child becomes fearful because they're not with their attachment figure. So they cry. Uh, they might. Uh, 
They might get clingy uh, with others. They'll call out, you know, mommy, daddy, where are you? If a stranger came up to them to try and help them, you know, they might lash out at that stranger because it's not the person that they're uh, that they want to be attached to. And what's happening in the brain is um, the brain starts cranking out dopamine. Now, you might say, well, I thought dopamine was your happy chemical. And it is, you know, dopamine is a chemical that uh, is um, made in the brain when, you know, we in, in different situations, but, but mostly, you know, when we have a, a very joyful experience. But in a person experiencing separation distress, the brain will start to crank out extra dopamine because they're actually anticipating the reconnection. They're seeking the reconnection. So I say this because we know that in the, the field of neuropsychiatric symptoms, agitation and aggression, one of the drugs that's most commonly used are antipsychotic drugs, the family of antipsychotic drugs. And actually they work about a third of the time. I am not advocating medication use. Remember the name of the talk is managing behaviors without medication. I'm just saying that there is a biological reason why antipsychotic drugs sometimes work because antipsychotic drugs block dopamine receptors. They effectively reduce the effect of dopamine in the brain. So if the person's seeking behaviors are, they're crying, they're clinging, they're calling out, they're lashing out, is driven by excess dopamine, those drugs can be helpful. And sometimes if non-medication means have been exhausted, then it can be a strategy that can be used with a lot of hesitation. And I'm not going to say too much more about that today. So you might be saying, well, well, that's fine. I understand separation distress in a child, but what does uh, separation distress or what does attachment, uh, attachment bonds and separation distress have to do with people living with dementia? And so what I would say is a lot, because memory and cognitive loss, it really sets every person living with dementia uh, up for attachment uh, loss and separation distress. And in fact, uh, many of the behaviors, as I've said, that people exhibit are because they're feeling attachment loss and then exhibiting separation distress. And so what I want to do is sort of talk about, well, how does that play out from an attachment perspective in a person living with dementia? So I want to come back to the notion of insecure attachment. And so we know from, from um, our training on insecure attachment that there's basically two different insecure attachment styles. One insecure attachment style is called avoidant attachment. That's a person who grows up in their family of origin, especially their parents. Maybe they weren't responded to, they weren't attended to emotionally. So that person, you know, tends to learn how to self-soothe, to kind of go off on play uh, and play on their own uh, because they know that they've got to kind of you know, manage things uh, without a lot of parental engagement, oversight, and involvement. So as adults, they tend to be more avoidant. They tend to be isolationists. On the other hand, let's say you have more of an overbearing parent or a parent or parents who were more inconsistent and in when they paid attention to their children. So the child is not exactly sure when they're going to get attention or maybe sometimes they get too much attention. So then, you know, this is, I'm doing very simple explanations, but they're more anxiously attached or ambivalently attached uh, uh, is sometimes the expression used. And so they're going to be more overbearing in relationship. You know, they're going to be more uh, extroverted in the re relationship, maybe more overreaching with their partner um, and maybe almost so that their partner might feel that um, this person is being invasive uh, in the relationship. They may push their partners away because of that uh, anxious attachment style. And so you see these patterns in people living with dementia. So the seeking response 
that kind of uh, anxious attachment in a person with dementia may look like anxiety or worry or fear, or there may be overt panic or anger or aggression. Think about Rebecca, you know, my wife, Rebecca, looking at me and, and saying, I don't know who this guy is. You know, um, unknowingly, when we went to sleep the night that situation happened, of course, we got in the same bed because we'd been in that same bed for, you know, 31 years. But when I when we got in bed together, Rebecca pushed all the way to the edge of the bed and she turned her back to me and she said, I'm scared that you're in here. I'm not comfortable. And so, you know, sort of just think about that from her perspective. There is a strange man in bed with her. You know, the bed, I mean, just think of what the bed represents, right? It's supposed to be a place of comfort and rest. And, you know, it represents in a marriage, a place of intimacy. And she, she wasn't feeling any of that. She wasn't having any of that. So from that night forward, I slept in a different bed. We no longer shared that. She was anxious. She was worried. She was fearful. She was panicked. I wouldn't say in that moment she was so much aggressive, but um, uh, but but that's what she was experiencing was this anxious attachment because our attachment bonds were severed. They were broken. And when it came to giving her care, like trying to do a shower, uh, that's where the aggression came in, the anger and aggression. So I had to uh, hire a female aide to come in and, you know, start doing some of the things that I used to do uh, because she was resistive of that care. Um, you hear from uh, care partners quite a bit. You know, my loved one says, I want to go home. I want to go home. They might start, quote, wandering. You know, so if someone is in um, assisted living, let's say, and they're trying to leave, you know, because they want to go home, then the person gets transitioned into memory care, which is just assisted living with locked doors. When all they're trying to do is find an environment that's familiar to them. And so they want to go home. And then you may hear distressing vocalizations, you know, if the person is really uh, isolated. I think about this. Um, uh, and so uh, at Wake Forest, where I worked, we have um, we have a center of aging. It's one building. So all aging related activities uh, go on there. It's a sort of a, a medium sized building. And we have an inpatient unit. Uh, uh, which is all just inpatient geriatrics. And so um, our my team used to do consultations um, on the inpatient unit. And inevitably, you know, we would go on to the inpatient unit and there would be, you know, two or three or four uh, seniors clustered around the nursing station uh, in their wheelchairs or their chairs that had the little tables on them. And so you would have to walk by that nursing station coming onto the unit. And always there would be one or two of the people sitting there and they would be having these repetitive dist distressing vocalizations. You, you come here, help me, help me. And if you got close enough, they would grab onto you, right? And they would pull you in. And so what do you naturally do in that situation? You know, you're gonna take about a, a path like five feet away because you don't want to be grabbed, you know, and you don't want to engage uh, unless, you know, that's your job and, and that's your purpose to engage with that person. But that's where these distressing vocalizations are coming from. It's coming from the separation distress of, you know, I need somebody close to me, you know, come be with me. And yet what we naturally do is we tend in these situations when, when we're with anxiously, around anxiously attached people is they tend to push us away or we distance ourselves from them.
So that's more the seeking response or, you know, what would be in, in attachment language, sort of the anxious or the ambivalent attachment style. But what about the person who has an avoid more an avoidant response? So we saw this with Rebecca too. She would have periods where she would withdraw and she wouldn't even get out of bed. You know, we'd try and get her up in the morning and she would be curled up in bed and she would be crying and she uh, would just be, you know, t saying things like, nobody loves me. I'm all alone. Where am I? You know, this sort of apathy, but uh, it was not just the apathy of, no, I don't want to do anything. It's the apathy of completely, you know, being withdrawn. There's a sadness and a depression and a grief there. And you can just sense that that person is lonely and almost like a learned helplessness, you know, like a, 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 a fretful child who you just can't soothe or console. And I'm sure that, you know, especially if you work in, in care inpatient settings, uh, residential settings, you've seen people who are who have both of these kind of attachment styles. And these play out in so many different ways and examples. So this is the contrasting response. This would be more like in the, again, the attachment vernacular, the avoidant response. And so the reason I show this is that, you know, naturally, either way, we sort of don't want to engage with people who are exhibiting these kind of symptoms. That's our, our natural response. But what I hope the, the focus is, um, the shift that I hope will happen here is that now you begin to ask yourself, what am I seeing here? You know, is attachment loss an issue with this particular behavior? And if it is, is it more an anxious attachment or is it more an avoidant attachment? But either way, what is a way that I can help reattach and reconnect this person? And that's kind of what we're going to shift into in a minute is um, what some of the attachment-based strategies are. So as I said, when you see one of these challenging behaviors, what we tend to do is to distance ourselves from that person. Or, you know, they've distanced themselves from us if they're more avoidant. But it's the opposite of what they need. So, you know, I'm going to say in just a minute that we are all biologically, you know, evolutionarily, creationally, whatever your perspective is, that we are driven uh, to be in relationship. That is part of who we are as human beings, independent of culture, uh, religion, race, you know, no matter what, we are driven to be social beings that that need and want relationship. And so, um, so uh, how do we reattach? That's what the focus will be. Now, all I will say is that if somebody, you know, is exhibiting behaviors of separation distress, especially anxious separation distress, you can medicate that person. As I said, you know, they could be in dopamine overdrive, but that shouldn't be sort of the first response for two reasons. You know, one is it doesn't really treat the underlying core issue of their separation loss. And the second is that these medications have side effects. In fact, some of the side effects that they have can actually make the problem worse. And as you know, the, the sort of uh, the black label warning when you use antipsychotics for the behaviors of depression is there's about a one per to three percent mortality death rate from using antipsychotic drugs. So no, I'm not an advocate at all of medication as a first line strategy. So what are some of the strategies you can use without ma medication? So I'm gonna go through five of them. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, four of them in a lot of detail. And then I'm gonna give an honorable mention to, to some other things. Um, and, and then we'll kind of wrap up and, and take questions at the end. So the strategies I'm gonna spend the most time talking about are one, patience, or what I call patient love, or patient attachment love, however you want to say it. 
a second strategy, uh, which, which I developed called acknowledge, affirm, and redirect. A third strategy uh, using the five love languages. And a fourth strategy, which is familiar to you, uh, which is mindfulness. Not so much mindfulness in the sense of uh, using a mindful approach um, in and of itself in the person with dementia, but thinking about a mindful way of, of approaching a person who's exhibiting some of these challenging behavioral expressions. So let's dive into sort of the, the first one. So I'm illustrating each of these four major things I'll talk about with a case study. And these are actual case studies from, from my own counseling practice. So as I mentioned to you, um, the most common behavioral challenge that we see in, in the memory counseling program is uh, repetitive questions. So this is an example for strategy one of repetitive questions. So here's a man whose wife has uh, kind of moderate stage dementia and she, uh, she, they're sitting in the room together and it's in the context of they're going to go out to dinner that night at six o'clock and he has told her several times that they're going to go out to dinner at six o'clock. And then she says to him, uh, honey, what time are we going out to dinner tonight? And he says, well, you know, we're going out at six o'clock. And his feathers are not ruffled at this point. And then about five minutes later, she says, honey, what time are we going out to dinner tonight? And now he's getting a little impatient. So he says, we're going out at six o'clock. And then five minutes later, here it comes again. Honey, what time are we going out to dinner? And then he screams at her. We're going out to dinner at six o'clock, like I have told you, 10 times in the last 10 minutes, okay? So, you know, the explosion occurs. He feels terrible. She feels terrible. Of course, five minutes later, she realizes she kind of feels terrible, but she doesn't remember exactly why she feels terrible. But the terribleness sticks with him until he comes in my office and he might have tears in his eyes and, you know, he'll look at me and he'll shake his head with tears in his eyes. Right. And I sit down and I say, OK, what's going on? And he said, you know, I did it again. I just I lost my patience. You know, I just get so tired of the same question over and over. So, you know, so how do you deal with with this repetitive question issue? Because uh, it is so common. And so one of the things that we teach uh, in our counseling center, so we, we have support groups. Um, we use um, a curriculum based on a book that uh, I wrote called the Dementia Care Partners Workbook. This is also the framework that CaringKind uses for their support groups. Uh, I'll show you the book later. I, I have a leader's manual that goes with it. But we provide a lot of education. So um, the groups, we do 10 90-minute sessions for 10 weeks in a row. It provides kind of a basic educational curriculum for care partners. And then we do uh, maintenance groups. So in our counseling center, we, we have a large enough practice. There's seven therapists in our group that we have three different maintenance groups every month. And we've got, you know, we might have... Um, 75 or 100 people a month going through our maintenance groups that have been in our 10-week groups. But around this strategy of patience, uh, when we're talking about uh, the lesson on behavioral changes in early to middle stage, we will teach this principle. And it's not, it's not a complex thing. It's very simple. And it's based on the notion that Alzheimer's disease begins the disease process begins in the hippocampus, which is in the temporal lobe of the brain, kind of under your temples, if you could poke about an inch in. And the hippocampus is about the size and the shape of a curled pinky, but it's where your short-term memory is programmed. And so the disease affects the hippocampus and the hippocampus starts to shrink. And as that shrinkage occurs, the hippocampal neurons 
uh, get sick or they're dying or they're dead. And the person's capacity for memory is literally not there. You know, the idea would be the same as if you're right handed and all of a sudden I took your right hand, you balled it in a fist and I put tape around it and said, OK, sign your name. You wouldn't be able to do it. You wouldn't have the capacity to do it. And that's what we say to our care partners is the person, because of that memory loss, because of the disease, they no longer have the capacity to remember. And the way we say it is, it's not that he or she won't remember. It's not that they're choosing not to remember to bug the H-E double toothpicks out of you. It's that she can't remember. It is literally for that person a new question every time. And so um, uh, I have a video recording from one of our support groups where one of our care partners talks about this realization of when he finally understood this. And in that understanding, he became patient with his wife with repetitive questions. So it's very cognitive behavioral, you know? And so when she says to him, three times in a row in five minutes, honey, when are we going out to dinner? He captures that thought. And he said, you know, it's not that she's trying to bug the heck out of me. It's that she just, she doesn't remember that she just asked me. So now I'm going to choose to not get upset with her until she's asked me 20 times in 30 minutes. And if she happens to hit number 20, then I'm going to choose to say, honey, excuse me, I need to go get a cup of coffee. I'm just going to remove myself so that I can have a little mindful breathing moment in the kitchen. And that's the idea around teaching patient love is that it's, you know, it's a cognitive behavioral thing. It's the, the cognition that I can choose to respond differently because of what's going on in her brain. It's an empathetic response. It's a response that's really ba uh, based in, you know, the idea of what I talk about in my, my book. Uh, I, I use this, uh, my, my book, Keeping Love Alive is Memories Fave. We talk about something called hesed or chesed love. It's, it's a Hebrew word that means love that's about the security of faithfulness rather than sort of the thrill of romance. You know, it's that I can be empathetically faithful to her by not getting upset and choosing to love her in the moment in a patient sort of a way. So that's the idea of patient love. So patient love, it's easier said than done. Um, you keep this idea in mind that it's not that she won't remember, but she can't. So we teach care partners, you know, stay calm keep the drama level down. If you lose your patience, it's probably going to upset her. Then you're both going to be upset. Um, however, uh, she might respond to you if you get her upset and she says some mean things to you, like you're terrible. I can't believe you said that to me. Why are you so mean to me? You know, you have to learn to not take it personally, but rather, you know, what have I learned from this experience? And then to capture the whole experience sort of in your mind, you know, to, to push the experience from the limbic to the prefrontal, right? So that you can actually make a judgment. You know, what are my options to respond? What are the advantages of responding this way or the disadvantages of responding this way, rather than just a limbic sort of anger-based response? So that grace and mercy rooted in that attachment, the attachment bonds you have with the person will bring love and understanding and a more empathetic response. And last but not least is something my middle daughter said to me uh, one time when, when she and I were caring for Rebecca and, and uh, Rebecca was not having it. It was a sundowning afternoon. She was really agitated. Nothing we could do would help. She wound up pushing herself so hard away from the table, she tipped her wheelchair over and landed backwards and whacked her head. And so uh, Leah and I kind of went off after things settled down and we're like, this is so, this is just so damn hard. And, um, 
And Leah said to me, you know, dad, it just seems to me like we can only do the best we can do in the moment and no better. Like we're, we're only human here and we'll try and do it better next time. And, you know, the reality is that as, as a care partner or if you're counseling a care partner, you know, if they get it right half the time or a third of the time and they learn how they might do it better the next time, that's pretty darn good. And you can encourage people that way. You know, caregivers think they have to do it right 100% of the time. But that's, it's first of all, it's humanly impossible and, and it's just not the way it is. So let's move on and talk about another example. Um, um, this is a couple where a, uh, the guy had middle stage Alzheimer's disease the wife was his care partner. This person has passed away. I, I still have a counseling relationship more as a grief counselor for this woman. I actually just saw her last week. Uh, her husband probably died about nine or 10 years ago. But, but this is the story. So she's now 89, uh, but they had been married out of high school at 18 and 19. They were married 60 years when this incident happened. And here's the incident. They were in the grocery store. They were shopping together, just like this picture shows. And another man walks down the aisle from the other direction. And he passes them. And then he turns the corner. And so the husband, the one with dementia, says to the wife, who is that man that just walked by? And she says to him, I don't know, honey, I've never seen him before. And then he kind of stops them and he's getting a little bit agitated. And he says, sure seems like you knew him to me. And she says, why, he's a perfect stranger. And then he becomes dysregulated. This is not exactly what he said, but you can get the sort of worst version of how this would have come out. And he screams at her, you're sleeping with him, aren't you? You know, he made a reference to her as sort of a street, uh, uh, a street walker. So um, she was devastated. I mean, this couple, very religious couple, she had been faithful to him in marriage and she just lost it after he lost it. And she broke out into tears and she says, why, of course I'm not what you called me. How dare you say that? And she stormed out of the grocery store and she left him confused in the aisle. So I'll never forget when I, I walked in the counseling room and as soon as I walked in the door, she burst into tears and she told me this story. And she said, you know, I just didn't know. I had no idea what to say. Like, I had no idea what to do. And I say this to either care partners or healthcare professionals that work in the, the aging and dementia space. They'll say to me, you know, like, he or she did this or they said this. And I was completely stymied. Like, I had no idea what to say to them. So this plays out in so many different ways when a person, you know, they'll have a paranoid delusion um, or they'll have a hallucination. And the, the, their care partner, you know, again, a family or a, um, a professional care partner, they just won't know what to say or do. And that's really, that's why I developed this notion of this attachment-based strategy that I call the acknowledge, affirm, and redirect strategy. So how would that play out in this particular scenario? So I think the, you know, as I said before, our tendency is when a person does something or is doing something or they say something or they've said something that's a little bit kind of off the wall or uncomfortable with us, if there's a negative emotion behind it. So nominally, our negative emotions are mad, sad, or anxious most negative emotions, if we expanded that into an emotion cloud, are a variation of those themes. Our tendency is to first take a step back. 
But again, from an attachment perspective, that's opposite of what you really need to do. So the acknowledgement is to first take a step forward into the situation, either verbally or, you know, literally physically moving forward and to acknowledge what the person said. So for her, it would have been to, to first keep the drama level down, but to then step into what he said instead of physically removing herself from the situation. So this is the strategy that I taught, taught her. And I said, so first you'd begin by acknowledging what he said. So for her, it might be, oh, honey, did you think I knew that man? Or maybe she wants to acknowledge uh, the accusation that he made. Honey, do you think that I was intimate with that man? So um, if the person uh, is having a hallucination or a delusion or a misperception, you know, so people living with Lewy body dementia, they often have these paranoid delusions or hallucinations where they think someone is trying to hurt them. Oh, honey, do you, did you think that there's somebody hiding behind the, the curtains over there? You know, but the idea is that instead of sort of avoiding it, you're acknowledging it. You're, you're moving into the space rather than avoiding the space. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to why this is important, you know, but you're, if you will, you're mindfully entering the moment with them. And uh, from an, uh, you know, from an emotion focused therapy perspective, right, you're, you're engaging with them, right? You're, you're attuning to them. You're becoming present to them in the moment. So they're not feeling alone and disconnected. So that's the first part of the strategy. The second part of the strategy is to affirm the attachment bond. So in this situation, or if it's not a person like here, this is, you know, this is a husband and wife, but it's just to affirm whatever the attachment bond is that's appropriate in the situation. Might be an adult with uh, an, uh, an adult child with their parent. It might be in, you know, from a, a, a care perspective, it might be if you're a CNA and you're working with uh, a client, a patient who is, you know, bed bound and in the room, but you're going to affirm the relationship. So she's going to say to him uh, after she's acknowledged, well, honey, did, did you think I was intimate with that man? You know, why? Why? No, he's a perfect stranger and you're my husband. I love you, you know, and so there, there are other ways that she could say that she might in that moment choose to hold his hand. You know, she might uh, affirm their attachment bond through one of his love languages, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about. So maybe there, his primary love language is physical touch. She might put grab his hand, hold his hand put her uh, hand on his arm, or she might walk over and get close to him and put an arm around him. But it's the idea that after acknowledging, you're affirming the attachment bond. If it's, you know, in a more professional setting where you're the care person um, and you have a care recipient, you know, uh, if you were comfortable doing it, you might sit down and put your hand on that person's elbow, it's usually, or their shoulder, usually a pretty safe place to touch someone. Or you might say, is it okay if I just, if I, if I hold your hand or put my, my hand on your arm, you know, but you're going to affirm, you know, uh, Mrs. Jones, um, I've been your, your aide for three months now. And, you know, I just, I really enjoy taking care of you. You know, you are such a kind person. Uh, I was doing this talk um, in, a, a, in a live seminar, and I had a guy in the back of the room raised his hand. He was a, a physical therapist. And he said to me, I have this client. He worked in residential care. Uh, so he had a client in skilled nursing. And he said, I come and get her every day from her room 
for physical therapy because that's what she's in skilled nursing for. And every time I bring her back to her room, she says to me, you know, uh, I can't remember his name. I'll just say it's Joe. You know, Joe, um, uh, my mom is waiting for us in my room and I cannot wait to introduce you to her. Um, you know, I, I love my mother. I love being with her. And as soon as we get in the room, uh, I'm going to introduce you to her. Well, of course, her mother had died 20 years earlier. And this was a delusion that she had. Maybe when she got in the room, she actually had a hallucination. And this this poor guy, this physical therapist, he said, I, I just, I don't know what to do. So I just ignore it. So, you know, I said, well, why don't you try this? Um, so acknowledge and affirm. And so that might look like, well, Mrs. Jones, tell me about your mother. Sounds like you really love your mother. Um, and so, so that's what she did. She started telling him about her mother. And, um, and so, and that's really, you know, sometimes I say when you're not sure what direction to go, you know, go emotional. So tell me about your mother. You know, how did you feel about your mother? You know, when she starts talking about her mother, do you miss your mother? Tell me your favorite thing about your mother. What is the favorite thing your mother said? And, you know, and so I don't know if that was helpful to him but uh, or not, but it's the idea to, you know, rather than just ignore it, to acknowledge and affirm. And then the third part of the strategy is to redirect the person's attention or to direct it, you know, in some way. So in this example, after she's acknowledged and affirmed with him, she might say, you know, honey, what I would love to do is watch a movie with you tonight and let's go get some of that butter brickle ice cream that we love so much. Let's go to the next aisle and, uh, and think about how much fun we'll have tonight, you know, being together, sitting on the couch and having some ice cream. And so that's where you can direct or redirect their attention and try and sort of get off of the issue that generated the, the attachment loss or the attachment break and to sort of cement the, the affirmation. So that's the strategy of acknowledge, affirm, and redirect. So you're acknowledging what happened rather than ignoring it. You're affirming the love or attachment bonds uh, to help the person feel safe and secure. You're redirecting their attention sort of at the end of that. And again, what I'd say is easier said than done. They don't respond the way that they're responding on purpose. You know, I think what often drives the, the delusion of infidelity is that the, the spouse becomes less familiar in the moment. You know, they haven't lost the identity of their partner as their spouse or, or long-term partner, but that person is less familiar to them. And maybe in the moment, because of that lack of familiarity, there was some confusion and it made it makes the accusation of infidelity easier to occur. So, you know, they're not responding that way on purpose. You try and keep the drama level down and you try and not take it personally. So much easier said than done, right? It's an oxymoron, a statement like that. How can you not take it personally? But again, you try and capture the thought in your brain and say, you know, can I use this acknowledge, affirm and redirect strategy to, to sort of deal with this situation. And it's just a simple thing, the AAR. So we burn this AAR thing into the, the minds of our, our care group, our support group participants is, okay, think AAR, you know, acknowledge, affirm, and redirect. And again, if you didn't do it so well, you can do it better next time. It takes practice. So um, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna take a few questions um, you're welcome to put your questions like in the, the chat, um, into the chat, and Michelle is going to sort of look through the questions. I wish we were all together um, and we could benefit from an in-person uh, sort of contact um, and then share from each other's experience, but that's not the nature of these Zooms. So um, I'd be glad to take 
questions. We're going to do this for about 10 minutes. If you have to get up and have a little bio break, feel free to step away. And then we'll have time for more questions at the end. I'm going to talk about the five love languages and mindfulness next. And then we'll kind of wrap up uh, with a few other thoughts and notions before we do Q&A. So I'm going to quit good. talking and we'll take questions. Yeah, I'm waiting for some questions to show up in chat. And as soon as they do, I will be able to share. Just um, as we're waiting for people to put some questions in, I just want to remind those who may have come a little late um, or are on your phone, if you can rename yourself so we know who's here, um, that would be very helpful. If you're looking for CEU credits, that will also be important that you have that. At the end, um, after do questions and answers at the end again, for those who would like to ask questions, um, just to let you know, we will be sending a survey. I ask that you complete the survey. With that, will come a CU form. Um, okay, great. Here we go. All right. So one of the questions here is, um, how can this strategy work in a memory care, if the patient's in a memory care unit? Um, yeah, so I, I think... Um try it. Um, when you have somebody who's experiencing um, a challenging behavior, um, I, just uh, uh, try and get some some uh, experience using patience or um, uh, using the acknowledge, affirm, and redirect strategy. So I know it works. I have taught these strategies um, as well as the other two to people that work in a residential care setting, memory care setting, um, and they do work. It doesn't always work, um, but I think um, when you when I talk about the next two pieces, you can put these four things together uh, into, um, you can blend them together into a strategy that I think will make a difference. Sometimes, you know, no matter what you try, you cannot get a person calmed down. Um, and, um, you know, I say, um, you know, as, as good as these strategies might be, sometimes they just don't work. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, any advice for redirection when the person is being physically aggressive towards the caregiver? Um, yes, I think this, this is really difficult when, <laughs> when the person is becoming um, agitated and aggressive. So obviously um, the, the first thing, and I'm gonna talk about this from the, the perspective of you, know, you working as uh, an employee of the residential care setting is you have to make sure people are safe. Um, so you have to make sure the person is safe from themselves, especially if, if they're trying to hit you as maybe the um, the care uh, the professional caregiver, or especially if they're attacking another resident, you know you you've got to do what you need to do to sort of um, get people physically separated. But then I think this is where the mindful component, uh, which I'll talk about not next, but but after that, where the mindful component. Uh, becomes so important. So if the person is agitated or they're being aggressive, they're usually having some kind of vocalization. So you're going to approach that person as the professional uh, uh, caregiver, and you're going to try and talk to them in a calm voice. And usually they're standing up, often they're pacing back and forth. They're doing some kind of repetitive rocking back and forth you know, pacing in an agitated way back and forth. So you're going to want to get them grounded. So you're going to, you're going to want to say to that person, okay, Mr. Jones, you know, come, come with me. Let, let's just sit for a minute and let's talk. Or, you know, just come, let's talk. Maybe you'll try and gently grab their arm or their elbow or their shoulder and you'll try and usher them in the direction of a place to sit down. 
because that's what we do in mindfulness, right? Is we ground ourselves. We sit in a chair, we plant our butt in the chair, we put our arms on the the uh, armrests, we put our feet on the floor, we try and relax and sink into the chair. And that's literally what you're trying to get the person who's agitated to do is you're trying to ground them. And then uh, and then you're gonna uh, you're gonna begin to, you know, use some f mindful approaches. I'm stealing my own thunder a little bit. Okay, Mr. Jones, take in a deep breath. Okay, let, let's just try and calm down. You're going to use your voice. You're going to uh, you're going to speak to them in a soothing sort of a way. Okay. Now this is ideally it works out this way, and then you'll you'll continue on. I'll I'll finish talking about the kind of mindful approach uh, in about twenty minutes or so. But that's that's an example of how you can use that with the person who's agitated. So in a way, you're going to now integrate in the, um, you're going to be patient with them. You're going to integrate in the affirm, acknowledge, uh, and ultimately redirect strategy. So you're going to acknowledge that they're upset. You know, Mr. Jones, I see you're really upset. You know, let, let's go sit and talk about it, right? And so, uh, oh, you're having a hard day. You know, um, gosh, I can I can think of a couple examples when uh, when I've done problem solving sessions with with, uh, you know, care facilities. Um, but, um, you know, so you're going to sort of get that person grounded and then begin to do a little bit of mindful breathing with them and just, you know, bring the whole drama level down. And it it works a lot of the time. It requires you as the caregiver, you know, as so the CNA, you can teach um, in your residential care setting, you can teach your CNAs how to do this. You know, they have to understand the basics of attachment and what the root of this AAR strategy is. And then they can deploy it, you know, in the field. Um, but that's not really kind of what they're thinking. What happens typically in the moment is, you're, you know, if one resident is attacking the other, you know, you've got two, two a nurse and the, the, the CNA on the floor, they're ripping these two people apart, you know, and they're sort of shoving, what, shoving them into their own rooms, right? And the drama level actually goes way up before it goes down, which understandably it does, because especially if there's a risk of harm there. But, you know, you can really think about just... Like I said before, that, that's the core of application of these strategies is you're thinking about what's going on here. So to just give you an example, I, I had this happen in a residential care setting. Um, one of our, our um, continuing care retirement communities here in Winston-Salem, great community, but they had a situation where a resident, a guy was admitted, he had Alzheimer's disease and... Um, he, he was admitted to the memory care and um, he attacked another resident. And what happened is that resident was being helped up from a chair by a male CNA. And this uh, new uh, person who had just come into the, the memory care unit mistook this male CNA helping this lady up with a man attacking his wife you know, because he left his wife to go into residential care. And so he, uh, he basically, he attacked the male CNA. And honestly, the way this played out is the, the, the uh, place had a, a rule that if there's aggression, that the, the resident has to go to the emergency room. The person uh, went to an emergency room that isn't the one that deals with behavioral challenges the most. He got admitted to the psych unit. He was put on antipsychotic drugs. Uh, one of the side effects is it can prolong the, the heartbeat cycle. His heartbeat cycle got over prolonged and he died. So terrible outcome. So essentially 
what the facility, what <laughs> there I use the word, what, what the place wanted to do is they wanted to do like a mortality conference. They wanted to dissect what happens to say, we want to do this differently next time. That was not our intent. But this is this is what happens, you know. So we did. We spent an entire hour and we dissected that in the context of this content that we're sharing today. So, you know, the these strategies really they do work, but you have to teach them to your your staff and then you have to try it, you know. Um, so um here's another great question before we go on. Um, is it is it common to be more aware of your own memory lapses when your partner is in early cognitive decline? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think there's kind of two ways to think about this question. While dementia, while Alzheimer's disease begins in the hippocampus, the the memory part of your temporal lobe, eventually the um, the neurodegenerative dominoes fall. And it begins to, to spread to other lobes of the brain. So you get effect on the frontal lobes, you know, where you've got issues with multitasking and emotional functioning and mood. It affects the parietal lobes, um, which is where you have your balance function and kind of navigating in a, a three-dimensional world. But one of the, the frontal lobe functions that we have is insight. So insight is, you know, nominally kind of our understanding of a particular situation that's going on with us or other people. You know, insight is one of those things, those brain skills we take for granted because we just do it. But um, but when you begin to lack insight, um, then that's where you notice it's challenging. So some people lose the ability to have insight with their dementia. And so that can look like one of two things. For my late wife, wife Rebecca, she always lost enough insight that she never struggled with her memory and cognitive loss. You know, in a, it, it was a blessing and a curse. Like the blessing was that um, until she lost recognition of me for the first six years, she was a really easy person to care for because she was just calm and mild mannered and, you know, did her coloring and puzzles and activities because she didn't really have the, uh, the insight to recognize that, you know, she lost her, her, so much of her intellect. She's a very high functioning person, an IQ of 150 masters trained. Um, but other people, they lose, they, um, they uh, lose function but they have preserved insight. And they'll say things like, you know, I'll hate my effing brain. You know, I get so darn frustrated. You know, I can't remember. And they hit their head repetitively or bang their head on the wall. Why can't I remember? Why can't I remember? I had a patient once who was a world famous neurologist. He would whack his head on the wall, say, why can't I remember? Why can't I remember? You know, and so they have enough insight that it's frustrating or they'll be in frank denial. There's nothing wrong with my memory. I'm fine. Right. This drives the family care partners crazy. You know, you're going to have to drag me to the doctor. You know, doc, what the hell am I doing here? Right. I mean, it's just there's that level of denial. So it plays out in different ways. I think that that you can use that acknowledge and affirm and redirect strategy, but it, it's harder. You know, it's a harder sell for someone who has memory loss, you know, to, to acknowledge and affirm with them, you know, uh, but not acknowledge that they have memory loss. So, oh, dad, you, you know, uh, you, you feel like your memory is okay. I, I kind of see you know, that you are struggling with some stuff, you know, uh, but, but uh, I, I don't love you any less, even though you are. And then, you know, often, often if you're able to, to patiently sort of, you know, walk through some examples, you know, in the, the, in the, the same notion of like motivational interviewing, where you look for a little in with the person, you know, he might say, well, you know, maybe, honey, my memory is a little bit off. And so, uh, well, dad, you know, 
I mean, yeah, you, you, you do kind of forget where your car keys are a, a lot, but you know, we don't have to focus on that. Let's just find a place for you to hang your car keys so that you, you don't have to look for them all the time. You know, so we're going to designate, we're going to put a big sign on the wall with a hook that says car keys. And this is where we're going to hang your car keys. And then with repetition, it might take 20 or 30 repetitions, you can teach them to, to hang their car keys there, if that makes sense. So, so let me uh, share the screen and um, I want to jump back in and share a little bit more content with you. Okay. So I want to talk next about the, th the third strategy, um, the five love languages. And some of you may be familiar with um, the book, The Five Love Languages, um, or the approach of the five, the five love languages. And uh, this was developed by a friend and a colleague of mine who lives here in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, Dr. Gary Chapman. He's an interesting guy. He's a um, cultural anthropologist turned uh, Baptist preacher uh, and um, he developed a framework for how people communicate and receive emotional love using the metaphor of literal languages. And he wrote the book uh, 30 years ago called The Five Love Languages. He'll say, you know, I thought that book would sell a couple thousand copies and, you know, it would be an interesting idea that didn't really catch on, but it really has caught on. He has sold uh, about 30 million copies of this book translated in 55 languages around the world. And he's 86 years old and he's on the road every week talking about the five love languages still. He's really, really an amazing guy. So the five love languages are ways that people communicate love in relationship. So this could be a whole two hour thing on its own, but I'm gonna just do like, uh, kind of uh, love languages 101 here. So the five love languages in no particular order are quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, and uh, giving and receiving gifts. So let's, let's talk about those. Now, uh, Gary uh, and another colleague, Debbie Barr, and I wrote a book called Keeping Love Alive as Memories Fade, the five love languages in the Alzheimer's uh, journey. And it's actually the application I'm gonna to share with you now in the next 10 minutes or so. It's how you can use the five love languages um, as a toolkit uh, to maintain emotional relationship, to maintain love bonds in a person whose memory is fading. So the book kind of opens and closes with my family's story, my story caring for Rebecca and her life and journey with uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease and, and how the kids and I and how kind of our extended caregiving team, there were 17 of us who cared for Rebecca uh, in different ways, how it is that we kept the love alive through her nine year journey. And, um, and so, um, so Gary Chapman says in the first chapter of his five love language book, the deepest emotional need that we have as, as human beings is to love and be loved. So this is coming from Gary as a cultural anthropologist. He, so he studied the, you know, love from a cultural perspective, you know, over time and across culture and basically, you know, says that that we all kind of no matter who we are and where we come from, that we have this deep emotional need to be connected to other people. And so what he observed after counseling some 10,000 couples in marriage counseling, the framework emerged. And so the, the five love language framework, and he said that people tend to express their love to others in relationship the way they want to be loved. And that often the breakdown in a, a twosome, in a partnership or a, a, a relationship, a marriage is 
that one person in the partnership is expressing how they want to be loved. That's how they're expressing love to their partner. But that may not be how their partner wants to be loved. And I'll show a couple of examples of this in a sec. So the five love languages are acts of service, doing helpful things for another person with the intent of just lightening their load. Physical touch, deliberately conveying touch to your, your sense of presence to another person um, with, uh, with touch. It might be a hug or kiss or holding hands. Words of affirmation, unsolicited words of affection and appreciation. So, honey, I love you. Um, you look beautiful today. Quality time, giving somebody your full and undivided attention. Uh, kind of challenging in this world of devices today. And lastly, gifts, a visible symbol of your love, which may be purchased or it may be handmade, or it could be something that, that you find, um, but it's a tangible gift that's a symbol of your love. And so you might be sitting here thinking, uh, well, you know, what is my primary love language? I'm sure all of you have an inclination, or you might say, you know, two of these really kind of rise to the top for me, but the other three or four, not so much. And so you can actually do a five love language inventory. I'm going to give you the website. You can do it for free on the, on the uh, five love languages.com website. Um, but we all have, we, we all tend to have a primary love language and then secondary love languages. And what you identify is how you want to be loved. But the issue is that you tend to love others in that same way. So let's say that in this couple, um, she's more of a physical touch person and he's more of an acts of service person. So, so in that setting, she can want to grab onto him and hug him, right? She might hug him 20 times a day because that's what speaks love to her, but that may not be how he wants to be loved. And so if he, if she doesn't do things for him, maybe she's going to cook him a nice meal or she's going to do the dishes afterward, you know, then he might feel less loved in the relationship. And that's kind of the notion of using the five love languages as a marriage counseling tool is you begin by having each person in the relationship identify, well, what is your primary love language? And then how is it that you're showing love to your partner? You know, if if we say to her, well, you're a physical touch person, but, you know, that's all you're doing is hugging him, but not focused on his need for acts of service, you might not be, you might be communicating a lot of love, but not in his language. Or in this example, where maybe uh, he's a gifts person. So he brings her flowers, he brings her a nice piece of jewelry, you know, whatever. But if she's more of the physical touch or words of affirmation person, you know, let's say that her primary love language is words of affirmation, those flowers or those chocolates or those that jewelry is not going to fill her, her love tank. You know, it's going to be more with the words of affirmation. You know, honey, I love you. You know, I I appreciate you. Um, so that's the idea of the five love languages. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen, uh, you should see um, if you want to do a fun thing with uh, your partner, your spouse, with a, yeah, you can do this um, with a group of friends. You can go to the five love languages.com website and then you can pick the five love language inventory. It's 30 questions. And then at the end, you can evaluate what your primary love language is. Then you can talk about your answers like on a date. And I promise you that your partner or your spouse. Um, is going to answer differently than you anticipated, and it will make for a very fruitful discussion. So how does this play out in uh, relationships affected by Alzheimer's disease? So it plays out really differently. 
So what we know is as the disease progresses for the person living with Alzheimer's disease, that one of the features of progressive cognitive loss is that the person's ability to express themselves emotionally, their ability to express love diminishes over time. However, their ability to feel loved is preserved all the way to the very end of the journey, all the way until their last breath. So we're used to relationships, even if in the setting of, say, if you do marriage counseling or relationship counseling, uh, family counseling uh, in your practice, you're nominally used to having the people who are sitting with you in your counseling room, you know, being uh, at least in theory, equally capable of contributing emotionally to the relationship. But that's not true in this setting, that just by default, because people with dementia over time lose the ability to express themselves emotionally, even maybe from a perception standpoint to perceive being loved, um, that um, the, the relationship is no longer on equal footing. And so I always I say to care partners, often early, if I have a new partner in counseling, a new care partner, you know, no matter whether it is a spouse or a, a long-term partner or an adult child, that one of the hardest things that I have to tell you is if you think about the effort that you put into a relationship as a backpack, that you know, you're know you carrying most of the weight of that relationship in your backpack, that the depth and the breadth of the love connection lies almost entirely in the hands of the care partner. So here's an example of that. So in Rebecca's, in the late stage after she lost recognition of me, you know, so I was still working. That's one of the challenges of being early onset is, you know, I was still 50 something and actively working um, when, when she had her diagnosis. So when I would come home from work at night, I'd come home, I would make dinner, we would have dinner together. We'd sort of sit on the, the couch and we would watch, um, a little handheld DVD player so she could, we, you know, we could watch a music or video DVD. But essentially from the moment I came home until I put her to bed, at that point, she was pretty much nonverbal. So I am carrying the depth and the breadth of that relationship for that four or five hours. And I'm telling you, that is emotionally and physically and spiritually at every level, cognitively draining to do that. And that's one of the real challenges of caregivers is they're carrying that whole burden for themselves. So the, 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 um, the piece that you have to hold in your mind is that even though I'm doing most of the work, that I am going to you know, I'm going to use those five love languages as ways to connect with her because she can feel the love even if she can't express it or fully understand it, that she can feel the love. And so that's why we ultimately, we, we didn't really set out to write this book because we had the five love language book. What we were hearing from our couples and families where we would give them or, or have them buy a copy of the original five love language book is they'd say, we need more application of how to use this, you know, with my loved one with dementia. So an example would be, I, I mentioned to you that I would, you know, come home from work, I would fix dinner with Rebecca, I would help her eat dinner. We would go sit on the couch and um, because she had some visual issues with her dementia, I would play um, the movie Sound of Music on our little mini DVD player and hold it on our lap. Now, she generally, she had a pretty anxious attachment style. She sundowned quite severely. 
and she, you know, paced a lot. But somehow after dinner, I could get her to sit next to me. And she loved that movie, Sound of Music. I bet you we watched it 1,500 times. I could tell you every word of every song in, in the movie, Sound of Music. And so when, when we were watching that movie, I could sit next to her. I could have physical touch. I could hold her hand. She would let me hold her hand or we could lock arms together. I would lean my head on her shoulder. I would tell her that I loved her. I would bring her ice cream. And so here, just in, in that scenario, you know, is quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, and, and the gift, the gift of ice cream. And so, um, so we wrote the book and really talk about, well, how can you integrate, you know, this as an attachment toolkit um, for the person with dementia? And sometimes we say to caregivers, so now think about it when you're with the person, you know, and they're, they're agitated and you're trying to sort of uh, affirm and maybe redirect you know, can you do it by just sitting with them and spending some time? Can you calm them through touch? Can you calm them through words? You know, can you do something for them? Like if it were appropriate um, in your relationship, like a, a foot massage or a back massage, you know, or can you bring them a cookie or something to eat that will calm them? So that's the notion of, of the five love languages. Um, and here's an example, a case study that um, that I was able to use and a couple that I saw. So um, this is a couple who came to me and uh, they came in and they sat on the couch, the therapy couch. They sat about as far apart on the couch as you can imagine. And they told me that this is sort of what had happened. So she had mild cognitive impairment or er very early stage dementia. And he had gone from working full time to retiring. And um, and he basically took over all the household chores. So he did the cooking, he did the cleaning, he did the washing, he did the ironing. He took over all that stuff that she used to do and it drove them apart. And so they came in and she says to me, you know, we're here for counseling because he he just doesn't love me anymore. And um, and he says to me, well, you know, it's kind of we've just we've grown apart. She doesn't love me anymore. And uh, she says he doesn't let me do anything anymore since he retired. And he says, you know, I do things for her all the time. And she shows no appreciation whatsoever. And she says, I feel so sad. I'm so discouraged. You know, you would think at this point in our life, with all this stuff going on with my brain, we'd be closer, not further apart. But really, ever since he retired, we've grown farther apart. And he says, maybe the best thing is if I just spend less time, if we spend less time together. So, you know, here's a couple where when I hear this kind of dialogue, it's saying a couple things to me kind of metacognitively, you know, so metacognition is thinking about what you're thinking about. If I think about what their discussion is about, she's saying he doesn't let me do anything to me. It gives me a clue that her primary love language might be acts of service. And then he says, I'm doing things for her. You know, I, I do all this stuff that I listed and she doesn't show any appreciation whatsoever. So it says to me, well, maybe he's also an acts of service person or maybe he's a words of affirmation person. But, you know, that kind of dialogue, I thought, well, maybe this is a good couple to work with from a love language perspective. And that's that's the approach that I chose with them. So I got to know them and got to know a bit about their their um, their relationship uh, patterns, uh, some of the losses they'd experienced in their life and as a couple. 
Um, and then to, to, we did the five love language inventory. Um, I did individual sessions with them to kind of understand where they were at with their own expressions of the five love languages. And it turns out that both of them were. Uh, she was acts of service as her primary love language. Everything else was a distant second. And uh, he was primarily acts of service, but also high up there was words of appreciation. And so, you know, to make a long story short, uh, I had them do an exercise where um, uh, they sat down together on the couch at night. I said, now sit close to each other and uh, just watch your favorite TV show together. And it feels, if it feels okay, maybe you can hold hands together. So they did that, they came back, that went okay, you know, and so progressively, you know, um, uh, got them to just have more physical contact and then to actually share some of the roles and responsibilities of the household. So she was still able to do some things, but he was able to do some things and to sort of encourage them to show some words of appreciation. So after I had worked with them seven or eight sessions, they came in one day together, they sat on the couch right next to each other, they're holding hands, and the guy is beaming. And I said, Mr. So-and-so, you look happy today. And he said, we have something exciting to share with you. I said, well, what's that? He said, we've discovered spooning in bed together. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, you know, you know, as you know, we're not physical touch people, but so we always, when we slept, we each slept on our own side of the bed and we had, you know, two or three, three, three feet between us in a king size bed. We just preferred our own space, but we have discovered spooning. And now I roll over and she scooches up to me and we spoon together and fall asleep. And it was just, it was a beautiful story, you know, and it was a way that, you know, as she progressed on, she went on to, you know, have progressive dementia. She eventually did have to, to go to residential care, mainly because he had a heart attack and couldn't physically take care of her. But, you know, it brought them together using the love languages from an attachment perspective. So, um, so the last strategy that I want to talk about is mindfulness. And I'm sure that most, if not all of you, are familiar with mindfulness. I would expect that many of you use mindfulness in your clinical practice. So I'm, I'm not here to, to, to teach mindfulness today, but to make you aware of how mindful the, the skills and conditions of mindfulness can be used in both for, for uh, people who are dementia caregivers and also people living with dementia. And it's good for you too, is, you know, whether you're a medical or mental health professional or where you work in the, the aging and dementia space. So what is mindfulness? A couple of definitions. Um, so I just looked up on a, you know, I Googled mindfulness. So I, I found this website called headspace.com. And it defines mindfulness as the quality of being present and fully engaged with whatever we're doing, you know, at or in the moment, free from distraction and judgment, um, being aware of our thoughts and feelings without getting caught up or judging them at the time, you know, right? So you're, you're sort of, a, you have this awareness of yourself right? And then awareness of what you're thinking and feeling uh, without getting carried away by those thoughts and feelings. Or maybe another definition from that website uh, I like too, it's mindfulness is the awareness of unpleasant thoughts and emotions, right? The mad, sad, anxious kind of stuff that arise in challenging or stressful situations and then you make the choice, you make the cognitive choice that in the moment you're going to respond calmly, you're going to be nice to yourself, you're going to show some self-care and empathy, and that the purpose of doing that is to reduce the level of stress that you're feeling or, you know, if you're already feeling pretty stressed out that you're going to prevent it from getting worse, you're going to break the cycle. 
So that brings us back to kind of the root of so-called mindfulness-based stress reduction, which was developed by John Kabat-Zinn a long time ago, in which you employ the conditions and the approaches of mindfulness to reduce stress, improve physical and mental health, and alleviate the somatic symptoms of stress. So the somatic symptoms of stress are is how your body feels stress. So soma is just the Latin word for body. And the somatic symptoms of stress are those things driven by, so you, you've heard of your autonomic nervous system has a sympathetic and a parasympathetic component. When you get stressed out, you go in sympathetic overdrive. You get all these different symptoms caused by the triggering of your sympathetic nervous system. And then sort of what we need to do is we need to have a shift. We need to, to become more emphasized in the parasympathetic response. And that's the root of what, what polyvagal or uh, polyvagal theory is about or vagal stimulation because your vagus nerve is the nerve that triggers the parasympathetic response in your body. So it's important because when you're dealing with the challenging behaviors of dementia, whether or you are the person who is having those challenging behaviors, there's a lot of stress involved. And the, the kind of body reaction to stress is all the stuff listed here. I'm not gonna read through it, but it, as you look at that list, you know, as you're just reading, you've all experienced this you know, maybe when the fight or flight response has been triggered for you in a stressful situation and feeling stress continues, the somatic continue, symptoms continue as long as you still perceive that the stressor is present. And that's why I say, and when we go back to the um, uh, acknowledge, affirm, and redirect strategy. Remember, the second bullet point is to remain calm or to help the person become calm. Because as long as their perception or your perception is that there's something bad going on that's driving the mad, sad, or anxious emotions, as long as the perception of stress is still there, your body is going to crank up your sympathetic nervous system is going to make adrenaline and cortisol that's going to then go to the different organs in your body that make your heart race and your body, your skin sweat and your uh your your breathing feels short and so on and so forth so is stress helpful or harmful well acute stress is both it's helpful in the sense that if you get in a potentially dangerous situation, you know, you have that fight or flight response. Um, and if, you know, if you need to flee harm, then that's what the acute stress response does is it helps sharpen your, your cognitive focus and lets you get the heck out of there. But it can be harmful if it causes you to freeze or if the stress of the moment is driving these behaviors I told you about, like with Rebecca, where she's agitated, she wants to go home, she's trying to leave the house, you know, and walk down the street, it can be harmful. Chronic stress, on the other hand, is just always harmful. It is not good to be chronically stressed. And I have a whole talk just on that slide right there, how it affects your physical health, your mental and cognitive health, your appearance and your daily functioning. So, um, and so chronic stress is just harmful and we need to be mindful of reducing stress. So that's what a mindfulness moment does. Now I was planning to have a mindful moment with you, but I see on my clock that it's 1148 and that stresses me out a little bit because we're supposed to be hitting the Q and A. So I'm not gonna do a mindful moment, but the purpose of the mindful moment is it's to make shift happen. And so the shift is that you want to shift the sympathetic overdrive, right? The somatic symptoms of stress. You want to move more to the parasympathetic response, which counteracts all that. It calms you down. It relaxes you. 
So these are sort of the, the components of mindfulness, which you're familiar with, but I want to get to this slide here, that mindfulness is what I call a cognitive and an associative experience. And the word associative is the, think of the opposite of what you know the word dissociative means from a therapy perspective. So associative means it's oriented to the present. Um, and sorry, I can't just give me one second. I accidentally turned off my power station and my computer's about to turn off. So that wouldn't be good. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, um, so mindfulness is a, a, a an associative response. It's oriented to the present, right? You're focusing on self, and then you're inwardly focused on on how you're feeling or what you're thinking. But it's also cognitive, right? Those are the steps of kind of the mindful exercise that I lead people through uh, individually or in groups. Um, but you you have to pay attention and you have to think about you know rounding yourself and scanning your body and doing the deep breathing that is what Dr. Kabat-Zinn said. You know, as you take in those deep breaths, you're literally shifting your, your nervous system from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. But dementia, by its very nature, is disorienting and dissociative. So getting back to the question you asked, Michelle, you know, of the person asking, well, how do I, you know, play this out? in a care setting, like if I, I were in memory care unit. And so you recognize that that person with dementia, you know, in the moment is disoriented and in a sense, they're dissociating. They're, you know, they're not fully in the present moment and then they're not really um, capable of controlling their thoughts and their feelings. And so now you wanna use the components of mindfulness to help them to become grounded. So the adaptations of mindfulness for a person living with dementia include things like, you're gonna use eye contact. And so, um, you know, for a person, especially with moderate to advanced dementia, eye contact communicates so much more than does than do words particularly. And probably the next sense that communicates the most is gonna to be touch and not words because language is a cognitive skill. Understanding language and saying words is a cognitive skill and people with dementia have a cognitive disorder. So to get back at the question that person answered, if Mr. Smith is the one who's freaking out because that male attendant helped a lady up who he thought was his wife and he thought he was the attendant was hurting that lady. Mr. Smith, look at me. You might hold on to him. You might stand right in front of him in his agitation and put one arm on each one hand on each arm and say, Mr. Smith, look at me. Come on, let's calm down come on, let's go sit. So you're gently ushering him right in this agitated state. You're moving him to the closest couch or chair. And you're saying, take a deep breath. So you get him down on the couch, right? You get his butt planted on the couch and maybe you help him lay his arms in his lap. Mr. Smith, put your feet on the floor. Now look at me. Okay, take in a deep breath. And essentially what you're doing is you're grounding that person and you guide their breathing. Okay, and if they're more advanced, all you have to say is breath in and you model it as loud as you can. Breath out. Right? and you're taking those deep breaths in and out. Mr. Smith, follow me, do what I'm doing. And you're helping them in a sense, you know, 
de-disassociate, you're helping them reassociate and come back into the present moment and be aware, maybe especially of what they're feeling. You might acknowledge, um, Mr. Smith, I know you're upset. Uh, I see you're upset. But you're okay. It's safe. Mrs. Jones is safe. You know, you, you're you safe. So again, you're kind of integrating all of, of these skills. And this is what I mean by, you know, in a care setting, you can use the condition and the, the skills of mindfulness, uh, even if you can't have what you and I are more, formal, are more familiar with as a, a mindful moments. And I'm going to just skip through now the last things. There are other forms of therapy, so I'm not going to spend any time talking about those, but reminiscence therapy, where you use the senses to help people kind of relive or re-experience things from their past, that's an attachment-based approach. Validation therapy, kind of a form of active listening and communicating um, uh, for people with Alzheimer's or dementia where you don't focus so much on the facts, like the the physical therapist, you know, whose who's, uh, client wanted to talk about her, mem her mother who had passed. It's not about the facts that the mother died 20 years ago. It's about, well, how did she, how does she feel? How does her mother make her feel? You know, that would be a validation approach, but it's rooted in attachment. It's rooted in her being able to talk about her primary attachment figure, or simulated presence therapy where you're using kind of an audio visual means uh, for a person who's distressed or agitated as a way of connecting them with their um, core attachments. And so all of these things that I've talked about today are really rooted in attachment. So um, I hope that, that through this talk, you have some new tools in your attachment uh, uh, toolkit. I should put the word attachment on that little toolbox there. Um, uh, I, I hope that you have some new tools that you can use um, no matter what setting you're in or um, whether it's a therapy setting, you work with caregivers, or you are more in uh, an administrative uh, capacity, um, uh, where, you know, these approaches work no matter what setting you use them in. So I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, I want to say one other thing um, is I do have some books um, and they're all available on Amazon. Um, the Dementia Care Partners Workbook. So this is a handbook for um, care partners. Uh, I say it's um, it it's an easier to read version of maybe the 36 hour day. It doesn't have the density of content, but it's just kind of a practical guide for sort of every caregiving issue you might experience from diagnosis to the end of life. Uh, I think 36 hour day is, is an amazing reference book. I call it like the Bible of, of care partnering. Um, but this also serves as a journal. So there's space for the care partners to journal in here. And also it works as a support group curriculum. And there are many, many settings where they use this book for a support group. This is, the next book is the Leader's Manual that is a, a companion with the Dementia Care Partners Workbook. If you like the neuroscience that I talked about, it's pretty much woven. It's the first chapters of the book is on the brain and how the brain changes through the course of dementia and the neuroscience is woven through. The leader's manual includes the theory and practice of support groups um, uh, is the first half of the book. And then it has kind of a how to use the purple book for support groups. We also have a, a leader's manual if you do support groups for people living with dementia. And I already mentioned my Keeping Love Alive book. So with that, I'll say thanks to Caring Kind for supporting today's continuing education. I hope you found it valuable. And in the last uh, few minutes, we can take a question or two. Great. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And I will tell you, majority of the comments that are coming through are um, words of affirmation to you, 
that this was absolutely wonderful and that you're really good at what you do. So thank you, thank you for being here. There is a there is a question here. Let me go back up because there's so many good questions. What are your thoughts on con compassionate deception or therapeutic lies? <laughs> I'm all for them. Yeah, I think uh, in, in my book, I call them uh, fiblets. So uh, Applebee's has riblets. Uh, dementia care partners have fiblets. And I, I just think that um, that there are situations where you really... Um, you have it, that you're less likely uh, to cause disruption and distress. Uh, you're more likely to keep the calm and peace uh, by saying something that is only partially true or is not true at all. And so I think it's an important tool in the toolkit. This other one actually I think is more of a statement, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, I just lost it one second. When you have divergent love languages, acts of service versus physical touch, and it becomes a real issue. One doesn't want of the physical, the caregiver, as much as the loved one. And the other partner gets angry and the caregiver feels angry and pressured. Yeah. So um, when so most people in, in a partnership or a couple or a marriage, they don't have the same primary love language. So when you use the love languages from a marriage or partnership therapy perspective, it's really about the sacrifice that you make having a different love language than your partner, it's the sacrifice you make to love them in the way that they want to most be loved. So if I don't like to be hugged, but my my wife does, then I am going to be very um, intentional about hugging her because I want her to feel loved. And um, if I don't like to be hugged, but I like when she, um, you know, uh, cooks me a really wonderful meal, even if she doesn't like to cook, she's going to cook that wonderful meal because that's how she's going to sacrifice for me. And so when you do marriage therapy using the five love language paradigm, you know, you, you understand how people want to be loved individually but then you bring them back together and you say, okay, for the next two weeks till we meet again, you're going to only focus on loving her the way she wants to be loved. You're not going to worry about you, how you want to receive love. You're just going to be focused on her or him, whatever the case may be. So, um, and so you learn to take the extra step to love the other person in the way that they want to be loved. And then the other person in the relationship does the same thing. And what hopefully happens is that they learn to talk each other's language and they're able to re-enter the dance where, you know, there's give and take on both sides, but it just feels better than it did coming in where they, you know, they were, um, they, they were doing their sort of, you know, demon dialogue of, pointing fingers at each other of how they weren't loving one another. It just changes the focus. Thank you. Well, we are at um, the end of this session. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, just so everybody, just a reminder that we will be sending a survey and ask that you complete that. That helps us. Um, also, we'll be sending in along with that, if you're looking for social work CEU credits, um, there'll be a form in which you can get, you can um, fill that out and we'll get that going for you. Um, you will receive a copy of the of um, Dr. Shaw's slide deck um, in a PDF format. So that will be sent to you as well. One question here for you, Ed, is um, are you available for one-on-one um, -on -one Zoom sessions? Uh, so 
Um, I, I, I don't do one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions <laughs> for, um, for clients. I have an, uh, an individual in, in-person part-time practice. I am available for speaking engagements, for consulting work. Uh, you can go to my not so great website called empatheducation.com uh, and see kind of the range of things that I do. But uh, my email is on the first and last slide of the, sl the slide deck. And I certainly encourage you to reach out via email if you have a question. I, I would be glad to, to answer that question as best I can. So, um, so yeah. Well, thank you very much again. And we were so happy you were here. Um, just so others who want to come to another educational moment, we do offer them monthly. Um, next one is March 18th, 6 to 8 p.m., our monthly educational meeting. And the topic of that meeting is going to be genetics and dementia. Genetic. So um, good opportunities to learn always. So we look forward to seeing everybody again. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw, for doing this for us. Um, we can't wait to have you back again. Um, Thank you. This, is, this was more than wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Bye, y'all. Thank you, Dr. Shaw.